Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our, our second panel of witnesses, uh, Ms. Harada, Moody Harado and Ms. Casey. Thank you especially for your concrete suggestions uh, from your perspective. Uh, we, that's gonna be really helpful to us going forward. Um, uh, Deputy S Assistant Secretary Cruz, you, you talked about responding to our questions that we sent in a letter. We sent the letter in June of 2018. We got the response when we walked into the March 2019 meeting with Deputy Secretary Tasuda and Director Dearman. When we walked into the meeting, that's nine months. A woman can grow a baby in nine months. It shouldn't take that long to get answers to questions to members of Congress who have a responsibility to make sure that these students are, are being safe. So I just wanted to point out that that's, uh, that's unacceptable. Um, I, I'm also, uh, Mr. Cruz, I'm, I'm really concerned and alarmed about what happened what, what appears to be a pattern of students at Chamawa who have either struggled to get medical care, particularly for mental health and addiction. I'm even more alarmed uh, or, or equally alarmed about what appears to be a pattern of, of students being sent home, sometimes for uh, supposedly disciplinary or ostensibly st safety reasons, the legitimacy, the legitimacy of which has been questioned by families uh, and staff at Chamawa, often without due process. Um, and then sadly, with several students dying shortly after leaving Chamawa, Marshall Friday, Flint Tall, and more recently, Robert Tillman. What steps have Chamawa BIA and BIE taken to prevent this situation from happening again, and how is the staff, student, and tribal input incorporated into all of that? You, you heard Ms. Casey talk about teaching a suicide prevention class that was interrupted. Uh, obviously, that was an important class. So, so can, you, can you address what are you doing other than ending a suicide prevention class that seemed to be benefiting the students? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. I think um, it, it's not an easy topic to deal with and the Assistant Secretary has made this a very big priority of her student safety. So part of that strategic direction I referenced, um, there are concrete steps for the BIE to um, try to be more responsive in that school safety um, environment and promote school safety. And um, the other part that makes this very complicated is the HIPAA. Um, what I've been told from our school leaders is when we send a student off-site to an IHS clinic, they don't always get um, the full scope or understanding of what that student is going through on the medical side. And so there's kind of that firewall and so we're told on a numerous amount of occasions that we don't always know what's happening on that health side. And so as you can imagine, there's that conflicting statute. And so I would look forward to working with Congress and identifying maybe a responsible well, way where there could be notification we, to school we, leaders. We look forward to that too. And, and, and Mr. Cruz, you, you said this is not an easy issue. It, it's, it's also not easy for um, Marshall's family or Melissa's family or Flint's family or Robert's family. Um, and, and I submit that it's probably a lot harder for them to deal with this than it is for the Bureau of uh, Indian Affairs and Bureau of Indian Education. Um, also, you talked about the, Mr. Cruz, you talked about the harmful history of assimilation of Native youth and really concerned that the BIE schools are filling to meet the needs of students who have, have experienced sort of historical trauma. Um, the, the Marshall, we heard about Marshall and f feeling more at home with students at Chamawa because of that connection. Um, Congressman Schrader and I have been working with the school. I, I know they're trying to recruit and retain native teachers and staff, uh, and we're calling on the BIA to provide more information about recruitment and retention efforts, but we have not received a sufficient response to that, that request. So uh, it, we know how important it is to preserve the expression of tribal traditions and customs. Uh, I'm really disturbed about the not even allowing students to wear tribal um, uh, clothing and, and th that, I, I, that baffles me. I don't understand that. Um, so we, we've heard that teachers and staff receive a culturally informed three-day training. So what is that? What's, what's in that training? Uh, how can they learn everything in three days? And is there evidence it's effective? And what are you doing to improve the recruitment and retention of native teachers and staff? Yeah, I don't know about that specific three-day training, um, but I will say across the board, uh, Indian Affairs in a lot in the two bureaus we have Indian preference, and so all of most of our employees need to be Native American, 
Um, and then we try to do that at the teacher level as well, as get as many enrolled Native Americans in front of the classroom. You know, uh, uh, the education statistics show students do better if they have a Native American teacher in the classroom. Nice. And so that's definitely a priority of the BIE. I think where we could work together is there is a significant backlog in the background checks over at OPM. Um, our teachers need to undergo uh, that, the same security background check to be in the school. And so whether it's the teacher, whether it's a parent volunteer, uh, BIE really struggles across the system with getting some of those other culturally, um, culturally relevant and specific services in the school because of those background checks. And, and quickly, because the time's expiring, y you said you don't know about the culture, you can't answer questions about the culturally informed three-day training. Who can answer those questions if you can, Mr. Kerr? Oh, I'll have the Bureau of Indian Education uh, get you an answer for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back.